This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. journeys I've been on myself, which has brought me into contact with a range of what I would call public historians. That's a loaded phrase in its own right. For some of the constituents I've been working with, I would prefer the phrase that they're looking at personal heritage, because they're fascinated in a greater understanding of the world around them, often centred on their own experiences, but they take different research routes to get to a period of understanding and activity. So many of them start out by focusing on their family and they then go and explore through existing online resources, connectivity back many generations. But along the way, some of them then start to look at the social context of where they have ended up. So it's more than just building family trees. It includes house history, local history, social history, national, international history. That's the ideal world. But over the last 10 years, this has changed considerably, mainly through the rise of the internet as a place where you go to seek data. And I choose that word very carefully, data. And I'll come back to that. But equally, the power of broadcast media. And my involvement really started in the show called House Detectives back in the late 90s. and moved on to Who Do You Think You Are? Where I worked to first of all set up the concept and then conduct the research. Now back in those dim and distant days of the early 2000s, History on television was driven a lot more by what I would call a top-down view of the past, where you have academics often delivering wonderful programmes, giving you their view of the past, focusing on kings and queens, such as Simon Sharma, David Starkey, or visions of empire with Mal Ferguson. But it was very much as though they had sat down to the lecture hall and were telling you their version of the past, a historian on television. Whereas who do you think you are, in many ways, tapped into the zeitgeist of personal activity and looked at the past from the bottom up, the worm's eye of you. And in many ways focused on something which is often missed. Many people that I've encountered over the years found that this approach to history, the date led chronological approach, focusing on the great and good, aristocrats, kings and queens, that sort of thing, often alienated them from the joy of discovery because they were taught things in a certain order and certain things happened. There was no attempt really to apply this concept to themselves, to give it relevance, to give it that personal hook. And in many ways, that's where we have this perfect storm of opportunity with the rise of a programme like Who Do You Think You Are and the rise of the internet to empower and enable people to explore the world around them in a very different way way. Now my first encounter with this sort of public historian came when I was perhaps rather naively trying to turn my medieval PhD in state finance and fiscal history in the 13th century into a career and found that it was much harder than I'd been led to believe. And so I ended up working in the public record office, now the National Archives, where I was encouraged to develop collections for like-minded researchers such as myself. So helping to promote the legal collections, the cataloging projects, bring together academics and find ways that we could set up new activities. So it was a great surprise when I was put on an inquiry desk a bit like this, that the people coming towards me weren't asking technical questions about how the Exchequer worked in 1225, they wanted to find out information about how to trace their family history. Now I 
took a rather condescending view of this approach. It wasn't proper history. And that's a label that is still stuck. When you do your family tree, it is, and I quote from the Telegraph, circa 2004, self-indulgent navel-gazing. It's not a proper activity. It's something you do when you retire to pass the time when you then meet your ancestors. And this video, I suppose, I took into this research space. And I was struck by two things. Firstly, the enthusiasm of the personal researcher. The person who sits often outside the academy, who isn't motivated by acquiring a PhD or a master's qualification, or a need to undergo any sort of formal academic training at all. They simply want to find stuff out. And they come into these rather daunting places. Anyone who's been to the National Archives or certainly been for the first time will remember how complex it is. And yet in they come with passion and enthusiasm, trying to find documents that often reveal that, yes, indeed, their ancestors were criminals and transported to Australia clapped in irons, which they seem to find rather exciting. Lots of shrieks of delight in the quiet reading rooms when we find out that great-great-grandfather did indeed bark off his wife and spend some time in prison for it. It's amazing that often translated into the show as well. There's the Gary was a particularly good case in point. We told her a very similar story. I'm rather really nervous of what she would say. She clapped her hands in glee and said, oh great, a murder in the family, something to tell my friends. <laughs> Maybe not if it had been a grandparent. Anyway, I digress slightly. Passion and enthusiasm is a driver, it's a motivating force. Simply the desire to understand one's place in the world marks in many ways this sort of social scholar. But equally, let's not underplay the sophistication of the research techniques that many people organically acquire through this process of inquiry. When you are constructing a family tree, well, you begin by exploring one's own personal knowledge, so it's a self-investigation process. What do we know? We start with names, dates, and places. It's remarkable how little of that is actually known as a fact. When we work with our celebrities, we were astonished how many of them gave us their long date of birth. They all seem to be much younger on their CVs than they were in reality. But when you think about it, that assumed knowledge of one's own place often only extends one or two generations back. Parents, grandparents, how easy is it to name all eight great-grandparents three generations back? Anyone do it? Possibly not. That's only three generations, it's not that far. We're still talking within the 20th century. So that shows that there's an enormous knowledge gap that has to be bridged. But then we bring into play the next, or rather the first set of sources, the next stage of the process. And that's to explore what we have within our family knowledge, and that's the personal archive. We talk a lot about research resources for historians and investigators, and so we head to libraries, museums, archives. But actually, there is a huge amount of information tucked away in personal archives. A lot of it is quite mundane, but a lot of it is really interesting. I once did a series which was effectively an antiques roadshow for personal stuff. And the material that was coming forward was incredible. We have on the one hand some blueprints from Harland and Wolf during the construction process of the Titanic that had a plan for sealed bulkheads which surely would have saved the ship from sinking, which must have been discarded and the architect had taken away and ended up in personal possessions. Plus also some designs which had been commissioned by a British firm in the 1930s which looked suspiciously like sort of gas installation pipe which had been commissioned by the German authority, which eventually led its way into the emerging concentration camps. Fragments of history that make no way or make no mark in state archives because they have been taken by individuals and remain undiscovered. And that is what the family historian starts to look at, to build up a picture of their place in time. Photographs, journals, letters, correspondence again. The historians amongst us, isn't it fantastic when we find a cache of letters, particularly if it's a two way correspondence that can be reunited, that will tell us a little bit about the life and times of individuals? Well, personal archives contain all of that information, and the family historian scours them for these snippets, these clues, these insights into what motivated somebody to help them on their journey. 
And then they draw it all together into a map of their roots and a tree and start then tackling state resources. So, civil registration, birth after death, going back to 1837 in England and Wales. The census returns. Again, a fantastic resource for the social historian or the house historian looking at property changes over time, the physical impact of local change as towns and cities contracted or grew over the period of the Victorian desire to create bureaucracy and generate records initially to help with the war effort in 1801 fear of the Napoleonic invasion but increasingly as a tool to start to plan resources into the great shift from the countryside into the towns and then look at health. So these resources which one group use to investigate the history of society but another uses to understand where their family were and to contextualise. So automatically they've gone back a good 160, 170 years into the middle of the early part of the 19th century. And that's when they jump off and go into local resources to extend the family back. They look at ecclesiastical records in parish registers, but equally probate records through the courts. They then start looking at placing their family back into a much wider context. So as the research trail to pinpoint individuals grows cold, they then broaden it out and look at what society was like, whether they were part of pre-industrial revolution, a manorial system. I've seen many family historians have started out and found an ancestor who was of sufficient status to appear in manorial records and become an expert in that local area. And this is what I mean by personal heritage. It is that fusion of genealogy, local history and house history. It's that context. And much of this activity takes place at this stage offline. I'll come back to the internet impact on this a little bit later. But the really important thing is that the sophistication of local and family historians is to be found in the way they extract information from their local and applied knowledge in archives. And to a lesser extent, libraries and museums as well. But they scribble away in hitherto unknown resources and then they bring it all back together and they create their family trees. And they share this stuff. They tell each other. They tell me an awful lot of the time, which is great. But every now and again, there's a wonderful story that you can then work with. But they do like to swap this information around, but they exclude the academy. It's all done through family history societies at local or national level, increasingly these days online. So this information could be a goldmine for the academic. And there are some attempts to obviously connect into this new and emerging market of research data and personal archives. Some departments have made a real play in trying to work with local family history groups to set up projects. A lot of information relating to poverty and the workhouse system has been mined. And there's Peter Higginbotham's site, workhouse.org. But equally, through that, a number of projects have spun out, looking at very specific pieces of information corresponding to to and fro, which have then been outsourced to local and family history groups to then do some transcription work so that other people can discover it and then link in their findings as well. So it's the second half of that piece of correspondence, what we may well have in the state archive, can be complemented or expanded on by looking for these hidden gems that are still locked away in the personal archive sector. So there needs to be this approach to try and bridge the gap. Now, the other problem is that the research methodology, when we watch an episode of Who Do You Think You Are, is less than robust, shall we say. It's edited for TV. And a lot of that is obviously because the programme is meant to entertain. And there's an assumption amongst programme makers that that kind of stuff isn't interesting. Perhaps missing the point that many people watch the show to get those tips. Which is why they did in the first series, sort of a 10 minute behind the scenes element. But the real power of the show is, again, motivational. And it's tried to show that this approach to the past, this bottom-up, actually can help you identify something that you can take forward in your life as well. So there's a real practical impact in undertaking a piece of research of this nature. So the traditional family history we've discovered is inquisitive and enthusiastic and they have constructed their own research 
profile and journey. They've developed their own skills. But now they're encouraged to apply some of this in an aspirational way. And some of the early series of you think you are, I think, have shown the way and had a real impact, which I'll just pause to explore before I talk about how we can perhaps develop this a bit further. It was always very difficult when putting one of the shows together to find a coherent narrative. And some of them were easier than others. Some of them were working with um, Jamie Clarkson, for example. He was motivated initially by finding the missing millions. So he went out trying to find out what happened to kill the fortune. And it all got frisked away in fast cars and fast women in the 1920s and 30s, which was fun. But Ian Hislop was a different kettle of fish, and he came to this process with a clear sense that he wanted to know more about his military roots. He'd been in school, and he was fascinated by the Boer War. He'd written an essay, all gun ho boys, adventures sort of stuff. And that was his impression about what warfare was like. But when he actually started to look at the show, he had a very different experience. And the first was just going back not that far to his mother and exploring what it was like for her growing up in the Channel Islands by taking him back there and realising that this place was under German occupation and trying to match that with archive footage of what this must have been like. So there was a real sort of perception shift that part of Britain, by extension, was occupied and what life must have been like. So there was an empathy starting to build up by taking him to a place it wasn't just a sort of dry, academic approach, it was immersive. But equally, we went further and further back. I think it's quite relevant to the way we look at a public history approach to the commemoration of the First World War. When we shot this film again, it was about 2003, 2004, so quite a way off the plan the process. And we decided to investigate his two grandfathers who were in the army by once again, taking them to the places that they had served, and getting them just to think and explore what that meant. So this is a very practical, hands-on approach to research. One of his grandfathers was in a Scottish regiment, militant in France during the 1418 war, and we went back there and visited the place, which interestingly still had the Scottish souls out flying, so there's that elements of remembrance, public remembrance of the debt still being paid. And then we went slightly beyond to the lines of the trenches. Now we matched all of this experience up with written record. So we extracted elements of the Union War diary and matched them up with the trench maps so that we could identify exactly where his grandfather would have stood on the day of a major offensive. And then read out the operational commands that he would have heard and had to act upon. This was living history in many ways. And on this particular occasion, the plan was to lay down a barrage during the night and then pause whilst the British forces assemble and then, having destroyed the enemy lines, march slowly across and take them. Nice and simple, because of course everything's like that in the heat of battle. And lo and behold, the barrage is laid down and there's a nice 15 minute pause and they're not just fixed bayonets and over the top they go. Now, unfortunately, they've miscalibrated the artillery and they've been panning position behind enemy lines rather than on enemy lines. So of course in this nice 15 minute interlude, the German troops came out of their dugouts, returned to their machine gun posts, and started to shoot the people walking slowly towards them. Now Ian's grandfather had been slightly protected from this by a small cops of troops, and made for this and dug in whilst he saw everyone else walking around him. And this lasted all day, and under the cover of darkness, he was able to retreat with his group and survive. Now, that makes a dramatic story if you tell it to someone, but actually if you're stood in the spot where your flesh and blood was asked to undertake this, you can't help but empathise and imagine what you would have done in those circumstances, which is exactly what he did. And his reaction was kind of running in the other direction. And therefore he probably would have been rounded up or martyred and shot. So there was a nice element of historical realism that we could then bring into that sequence. The same thing happened with his other grandfather, who was a bit older, and had signed up voluntarily to the army, he was a career soldier, and had served at Spion Cop in the Boer War. So once again, off we go to South Africa, we take him to the location, and we explore how the battle unfolded. And bearing in mind, he'd written an essay about this when he was much younger at school, it was completely shocked him out of the sense that this was a good thing. 
Remember the person that most changed the way we approached this element of public history was Bill Oddie. And the story we wanted to tell with Bill was very much about the Industrial Revolution. His family hailed from the Northwest, and generation after generation they've been bound up in the cotton industry, even before it, in theory, been mechanised and industrialised. The family we traced back to the 1780s in Yorkshire. They were tenant farmers, and they did a bit of weaving on the side of Southern America. And then, way right across the border, the emerging mill towns started to appear. The enterprising bodies left, probably under the cover of darkness, and snuck over to Lancashire and signed up, working their way up the system so that they were over the position of some middle-management authority. All was good until we had the cotton family in the 1860s, when events half around the world cut off the supply of raw materials, therefore closing down factories in which Bill's community was affected by his, his ancestors was affected. So they had to make a decision, do they stay with the risk of unemployment and therefore starvation, or do they move on and seek work, which is what they did, and they found an institution a bit further down, which is stuck by material, hence they signed up and survived. All dramatic stuff, repeated generation after generation until we get to Bill. Now, Bill was interested in none of this. He wasn't interested in the Industrial Revolution whatsoever. He was interested, and what motivated him was a very uneasy relationship with his mother. And his mum had suffered from various mental health problems throughout her life, to the point where he felt completely alienated from her. She had been put in an asylum whilst he was growing up. A very traumatic thing for both parties, obviously. But he didn't understand why this had happened. In fact, he almost blamed her for some of the problems he suffered throughout his adult life. So his motivation for exploring the past wasn't to go back to the 18th century, was to go back one generation and have a conversation which he'd never had. Now we wanted to tell the industrial story, but to get Bill on board, we explored this in a bit more detail. And <coughs> it became clear that there was a really powerful story here as well. And this was the fact that there was an unknown mystery which we were about to reveal. Now we took Bill to a record office, it was actually um, the registrar's office, and we did this horrible sleight of hand where he was given a brown paper envelope containing three bits of paper. For weeks after, people came up to the archive saying, can I have my family tree in a brown envelope? <laughs> oh, hideous, that's what I mean, all processes eradicated from the show. But in any case, we were able to use this vehicle to get Bill to explore something quite revelatory. He opens the envelope, takes out the first bit of paper, and it's something very simple. It's his parents' marriage certificate, which he knows about. He then takes out the second document, and it's the birth certificate of his sister, which was a bit of a surprise because he didn't have a sister. He never had to. He was the oldest in his family. And the third document explained why it was her death certificate five days later. Now, this had been covered up. And so he was then able to, through this information, explore what had happened. And it turns out that this was a tragic, effectively, cold death. And not only from suffering from postnatal depression, the trauma of losing a child had had a devastating effect on his mother. But the family, I suppose, was pointing the finger at her for the loss of a child. And in light of current thinking, this was diagnosed as a mental health issue, and she was put into an asylum where she was given what they thought then was the appropriate treatment. And of course, this exacerbated the problem. Today, there would be counselling and support, but back then, the contemporary treatment almost exacerbated those symptoms and turned it into the very problem that they were trying to support. And we were able to use this to explore the history of mental health over a sort of 20 year period. Now this elicited a great response from the audience. And if you had gone to the BBC and said, we've got a great idea for a show, we're going to spend an hour with Bill Ollie talking about mental illness, it would not have been commissioned. But because of the way it was done, and the feedback that we received, this I think was when the penny dropped, this was a new approach to the dialogue between practical history and the people who were there looking for this. It was the first realisation that history didn't have to just be about 
talking heads on television explaining the story. It was immersive and it was powerful. So much so that by series two, we had Jerry Paxman weeping three times on television, which is no mean feat. <laughs> Again, digression, he didn't want to do the show at all. And he knew his roots. He was very white middle class, that's my background. I don't need to know any more than that. And it was only after a rather breezy encounter um, with John Reed on news Newsnight, who was then Secretary of State, um, where he accused Jeremy of being the attack dog of the BBC. He wouldn't last five minutes if you were brought up in Glasgow. This is put down to Jeremy. The next morning, the phone rings, and Jeremy says, If you can find me some Glaswegian boots, I'm going to your show. <laughs> now, we had actually, by complete coincidence, found some, but it was a story of real poverty, of abandonment. His great great grandmother had been widowed with nine children to look after. Her husband had been in the army, and when he died, she claimed a widow's pension. Unfortunately, it seems that two of the children she was claiming were born several years after he died, which she couldn't explain adequately, and therefore the pension was withdrawn, leaving her in absolute poverty, moving out of the house into a tomb turned in Glasgow, which we took him to, and he finally understood what it meant to be poor. It changed his outlook completely. That wasn't the beginning of the softening of Jeremy Paxson, but it certainly showed that this whole sense of visiting a place is an important part of the research journey. So I use those examples to illustrate that who do you think you are changed the way that this style of research was perceived. It wasn't just about building a family tree and going as far back as you can. It was aspirational and in many ways inspirational. And this is something that was latched onto by the data set providers. It coincides exactly with the move towards using the internet as a means for delivering large data sets. The 1901 census was released in 1902, just in time to crash when we started doing all of this research, which was most unhelpful. But from that point onwards, we've seen all of the census data sets digitised and indexed and made searchable, alongside the indexes to birth, marriage and death, alongside the probate record, and increasingly local material, the parish registers, are being digitised and indexed. And so we now have Ancestry and Find My Past creating huge data sets aimed at a very public audience. Now these instances of large data show the best and the worst of what I would call the digital future of research techniques. Because people are confusing what they're doing online as the old style research. And so Street Farm I asked have created search engines, and usually it's by name. And many people have used this to simply seek and locate and add and build online family trees. So in many ways, going back to the old style approach of how far back can you go. And this is all done through a search engine rather than the, con rather than the context of immersing yourself in local knowledge. And so we find this rather strange position where people are researching but not actually understanding. And they often miss things as well. It's a very different research environment. Many people were quite surprised to find that in the 1901 census they were related to the Ditto family <laughs> from their actual family name because it's transcribed what you see. So there's all sorts of anomalies there. But this has changed the way people approach archives and the actual source. Instead of using research techniques based around what am I looking for, what are the sources that can tell me what I'm looking for, what do those sources mean, how do I appraise them, if I want to these search engines, find what I'm looking for and pay it and move on. So it's done outside of context. And this, in many ways, has had a knock-on effect with the providers of this data. So there's a really interesting conundrum for the future of research scholarship about what impact this is having on the archives. We live in the age of austerity. We cut stage five and centre, which I'm sure will sadly not escape. But with the latest comprehensive spending review, the emphasis now falls upon local communities to raise their own money. A lot of the central subsidy is gone, and so frontline services will be slashed. And what is what's the best place to go? Well, obviously the archive community. So, these non-essential services are taking major hits. And so one way to protect those services 
is to commercially digitize. And you should send out a few alarm bells to us. Because the more we commercially digitize through these limited access portals, the harder it is for us as a research community to construct alternative research questions. So what we're finding now are many county archives posing the question, should we digitise with ancestry or should we digitise with farmland past, rather than should we digitise with a commercial partner or should we find an open digital model that best suits a wider community need. So the conversation has already gone to that level. And once these materials are digitised, then users go onto that platform, that portal, Ancestry Farm, that past, and never come back to the archive. And so, to provide a funding stream to keep the archives open, what we are now seeing is that the money comes in, but the people don't. And so there's a second a set of questions about why are you keeping the search open? and there's no one actually visiting. Now, for the academic scholar, access to those original materials is as important as ever. But to the personal historian, that is no longer relevant. And so we now run the risk of undercutting the very source of data that we rely on as well. Which is why we need to offer an alternative model of collaboration, particularly around access to this online data. Some of my Former associates when I was at National Archives had signed up to support the project run out of the University of Liverpool. Uh, without going into too much detail, <coughs> it aims to reconstruct the lives of many convicts, drawn from sources such as Old Bay Online, London Lies, and a whole range of other digital data sets. Some of those digital data sets have been commercially licensed, and it is almost impossible to get that data released for an academic project because it's much more commercially viable to put it onto a paper platform, which will then compromise the opportunity for us to undertake the sort of scholarly investigation, analysis, and data mapping exercise that we would like to do. So this is a major issue for us to look at. So we need to work with these communities, not just to get access to the individual research material, but to find flexible solutions to increase digital access so that we can all research on this material together, whilst recognising that we all need to get some money out of this as well. So exploring the open access data model is going to be really important, and perhaps looking at the economic viability of many of these platforms in the longer run. When you think about it, there is a commercial shelf life to census material becomes commoditised, it's available on all those sites and most people would have used it to build their family tree. And so economically there's only a limited value. Is this not the time perhaps to go out and see whether we can find discrete data sets that we can draw down into some projects or find ways of freeing up some of this for a different style of interpretation? Or maybe look at alternative transcript projects. There are some organisations out there, free BMD, free census, free reg, parish registers, other campaigns for reg activism to create a community of online transcription, a bit like the way Zooniverse are about to start doing with some of the Shakespeare texts, which is a very interesting proposal. So using engaged transcribers for the common good is a model that the academy can help support because our research outputs will be dependent on getting access to some of this material. It's worked quite successfully in the States when they went to digitise the 1940 US census. It was beyond the financial remit of any one company. So a couple of the digital models got together. We also brought in a range of free access transcribers, and that added value to their product, but equally allowed the academic community to engage. And so it was a different mixed economy model that benefited the public history community, but equally the academy as well. We should also perhaps have a look at the way these personal archives are created and curated as well. How do we get access to this? Well, there's a shift, obviously, in the way this material is created. And it's always very interesting when I do talks to family history groups, the people who are most wedded to the idea of keeping stuff, particularly the physical analogue material, 
in boxes, in chests, stuck in attics, down in cellars. And that's the motivation for them, in many cases, to go looking into their background, a photograph album, or a collection of letters. And yet, when you ask them, not a single one of them has chronicled or archived their own experiences. And we live in this interesting environment where we're creating our own paradox, where we're the most literate and focused generation in human history, with amazing technology. We're not actually keeping or curating this stuff. A lot of it migrates automatically online. Many of these and other historians now communicate by text, by email. They don't actually create those personal archives anymore. So there's, I think, another conversation to be had with the digital platforms where a much younger generation are automatically providing personal content, whether they know it or not. So in many ways, the next generation of social scholar will start to engage, not so much in a mass observation exercise, but certainly a review of what digital assets are out there in the public sphere. And there's some interesting data models already started. There was one project that used Twitter posts, where you could geolocate users to particular cities around the world. So you effectively created, based on some of the tag words, a happiness index. How happy was London on the 12th of January 2015 by the posts that were put up from people who were registered and the sort of words that they were created. So you can actually model mood swings over populations through time. So there's some fantastic mass data exercises that you can do. But at a very personal level, there's a role, I think, for the academy to act as almost like an honest broker for some of this personal data. Through digitization of personal archives of interest, but equally for finding ways of bringing some of this new social media data into the mix as well, so that we can help people curate the material, so that we can research on it, but equally provide impact by giving back the context and the results of our research. This can all be done in the digital sphere, and a number of certainly public history are starting to look to collaborate across the academy in different universities to see whether we can actually find a common solution. This is the year of thinking big. We need to find global solutions to many of these challenges that we now face. And I'll just spend a little bit of time before I wind to a halt looking at some of the practical impact solutions that we can find to everyday problems. Just giving a few examples. And this is in many ways about this sort of bottom-up approach to the personalisation of the past, as well as the use of some of these new trends to stimulate either economic growth or solve social problems. Let's go through for examples. One of which was a very bizarre experience I encountered in a women's prison. And I was asked to go in and help support a vocational course for inmates who were about to go on parole and obviously you need to see how they would then integrate back into society pick up the threads of their lives. And a rather intriguing parallel course was offered in addition to the <coughs> usual vocational or practical skills based training that was provided. And this was a short course on genealogy. And the idea behind it was to see whether or not people could then develop search skills to investigate a little bit further back into the past and not necessarily feel trapped by the situation they found themselves in, which got them into prison in the first place, or the immediate two or three generations which they felt had also shaped their present and their future. And so we encouraged them to find a couple of key figures, either people they wanted to aspire to um, emulate, or perhaps look at a path that they could follow through a skill or a profession that they might like to try their hand at, and then pick up the vocation. And this we also wrapped up with a little bit of a, a message around some of the people we see on who do you think you are, around well, how do you want to be viewed? Do you want to be viewed as the person who was in prison, the black sheep of the family, or the person who changed their life around? So there was an aspirational element to the whole process too. Through this life touch approach, using an element of history, research, and a bit of psychoanalysis, the reoffending rate of those who went through this course was virtually zero compared to other courses, which have varied from anything from 20 to 40 percent. So whether we had chosen a very good case study or not, I don't know, but it really made a difference to the lives of those coming through. So it was a really nice blend of using academic research to influence the impact upon people's lives. 
and there are similar examples all around the country, often unsupported by local universities who can become part of that firmament of fixture. There's another one, it's actually called Community Futures, that looks at a local group of individuals who are defined by other people because they had some sort of physical disability or learning disability which people used as a label to categorise them. And so again, using some of these research techniques, we're able to find figures in their past or some skills that they wanted to identify. So they created their own identity. And once again, it caused communities to form up that simply would not have been possible before. It changed the lives of those who went through it, but also profoundly affected those who had set up among the project. And you can extend this across a number of different areas as well, on an even larger scale. Let's start right at the top and look at tourism major industry in this country. But now, there's a trend towards a focused sort of tourism. Not so much heritage tourism, which obviously plays upon some of the heritage assets that everybody has in their region, but more of a sort of ancestral tourism. The sort of thing that will bring people back from far from places of the world to revisit their roots. And a huge amount of academic support has been put into discovering how this can be measured and try to understand the motivation. But in places such as Ireland or Scotland, where there are large diaspora communities in which the research can be rooted, it's very interesting that there are strong historical narratives around the diaspora phenomenon. And in Ireland, for example, it's very easy to point the finger at the wicked English, who obviously caused the potato famine and led many people to either die of starvation or dysentery crowding into the cities, or to leave forever on the coffin ships of the West Coast, come across into England, subsume their identity into that of the English communities in which they joined. And now, of course, the population dip, many people are returning to Ireland for the first time. They make their fortune, they come back. And this is an active phenomenon that the Irish government is playing upon. By putting their data online for free, in many cases, encouraging people to make that connection and come back and spend US dollars on a heritage trip to spend time exploring the lost landscape. And for those who are not interested in their personal heritage, there's golf courses, there's cultural tours, there's the landscape, there's all, all sorts of things. It's about getting people to come in and spend their cash. So much so that they've also instigated a scheme where you can buy a certificate of Irishness online, you can go back two or three generations. Everything can be monetized. Very similar situation in Scotland, where they've been doing this for a good 10 years or so. They've had two homecoming events, big, major features, so much so that Visit Scotland for the 2014 event employed an ancestral tourism office to simply coordinate regional activities. Again, they estimated there were 50 million people worldwide who traced their routes back to Scotland, and they actively went out and put on a whole season of activities, based certainly in 2009, around the gathering of the clans, last on that had been planned, it ended up in the Battle of Culloden. So they were a little bit nervous about how that would play out. It actually passed off relatively peaceably. But the whole idea was that people would come back and go back to their roots and stay in hotels and buy tartans, and whiskey and all sorts of things, possibly even in 2014, get a vote in a referendum. But it was a draw, it was history, heritage, research coming together. And that's a really interesting model when you look at it not so much on a micro level, a macro level, but boil it down to local communities. And there's one example that we'll conclude with that I think encapsulates all the things that I've talked about. And that is, like bizarrely, we ride a social heritage group, ride on the Isle of Wight. Now, the community was suffering a spate of vandalism in the local graveyard. And the locals were very concerned about this. It was disaffected use, nothing to do, balls, hands of dream. Can go over a few headstones. That's what passed for a Friday night in Ryde a few years ago. So the locals scraped together some money from the council and a small HLA grant to create a database of the monumental inscriptions on the tombstones that they were all lost. And with the support of HLF, they created a website and posted it. And they were then astonished to find people from around the world saying, Oh, oh this is really interesting. Can we come and visit? Because my ancestor is buried there. And so there was an immediate impact on local tourism, not necessarily in the big summer seasons, but on the shoulder seasons, 
and traditionally hotels and restaurants lay infinity. So they can immediately spot an impact. So much so that the number of visitors have increased where they wanted to restore two of the chapels that were in the graveyard as well. So they got an even larger slew of money, about £60,000, to renovate these two. One of which was handed over to the social heritage group that had undertaken the work to act as a graveyard classroom. But they installed information about the area and the project, but equally encouraged local residents to come in and talk about the heritage and deposit their personal archives as well, a focal point of the community. And they used this as a teaching resource so that all the kids would pass through this experience, not just to look at history and heritage, but also to do numeracy, counting up all the old accounts, to do art, where they'd go out to the graveyard on sunny days and paint pictures of the monuments and some of the effigies. They even had a session for a nature trap where they would go around one of the fallen slabs and they would lift it up and there was a family of slow worms underneath that would have failed to wiggle off and try and disappear. So this was supporting the entire curriculum. English, creative writing, design, ICT, wonderful stuff. And over the following years they noticed that vandalism ceased. In fact, there were now volunteers by people who would be terrorised by hooded youths coming up to them at all times of the year saying, I found some more information, do you want it? So it was a wonderful way of bringing the community together. Now it's not going to cure all the world, obviously. But it's certainly a demonstration that there are plenty of examples out there where my touch personal heritage, with control of one's access to data and impact, can be measured both in terms of research output and economic benefit. For me, that's a wonderful model that the Academy perhaps can start to have a look at. Some of these centres are forming up of their own right. We have a fusion between the Academy, the archives, and the stakeholders from this kind of community. The High, the Keep, for example, these new archives in Worcester and Sussex and other places, where for these same economic reasons, the Academy is partnering up with key stakeholders protect the material and find alternative publishing models, but also to run research projects around them. But working with the <coughs> constituents as well, bringing in the people to whom they're trying to reach out to value and measure impact. So if there is any sort of lesson or moral from what I've been talking about, is that research matters, not search online, but research, the full appreciation of the research journey in all its various ways. And that impact can be any one of a number of things. It's not always going to be the monograph or the research paper. And then as we move in towards the next breath, these are the sorts of projects that are going on out there that we can support and latch onto, but also help and shape and define. Because if we don't do it, no one else is going to. Thank you. So, <laughs> I'm also looking for time for some questions sense out of that rather rambling run through of a range of different activities. How are they linked up with the, those agencies that look for people who died in Hesse? Isn't that a nice income stream <laughs> to have immediate access to somebody's estate? Now, that's an interesting one because I ran a research agency that would get involved with some of that work. Um, the companies that chase the dead and also then try and link them up with the living are in huge competition with themselves. And it is an unregulated concept <coughs> of the Wild West of the micro economy. But <coughs> there's a lot of varying practice. It is big business. In the United in the test states, become material comes one of the cantiers, it's governed by the state. And if you can't find someone, then it's kept. So there's an incentive to go out and find people who will be grateful to receive money. So there is a lot of cash out there, but it's unregulated. And so anybody can go and chase this. And it is very much preserved for some of the private research companies to go out and find these solutions now. Well, in Germany, it only is regulated because of the Nazi group of us, because you know, people do a conversation. So is there no European directive? Not as far as I'm aware in terms of Monica but I'm sure it's an area where 
there will be some interest down the line. Now, the companies you see, you would imagine if they go out and find somebody, the money passes from the deceased to the identified next of kin or variants thereof, and they tend to make a 10 billion percent cut of that, which then gets paid back on taxes. So it's not done on the goodwill of the companies going out to search. They take a large slice of the estate and therefore it trips back into the treasury through taxes. Of course, if the money is found, I'm so sure in theory we revert to the state, but that's what companies do. These are public, public lists, so they all go and look at So if I'm found by my rich British uncle, or late British uncle, if the agency finds me, they take a cut of my inheritance? Now this is why I say it's unregulated, because they can say you have inherited some money and we can help you claim that money. And we can show that there is a connection here. And for doing all of this work, we'll take 20%. And you can say, thank you very much, that's great, off you go. Or you can go, no, I don't want that. And then you go yourself and prove it. So they're taking a punt on finding you, that you're not going to be savvy enough to go back to the various courts and say, I want to make this claim myself. And here's my proof. So they, they count in terms where you might have some, if you agree to this, they will tell you more information. It has happened to me. They picked the wrong person, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> they got short shrift off me. They weren't too happy. And I think I'm right, like, probably saying, and I think you sort of interjected it in the talk that the public quite often sees the academy as a bit distant, sort of, you know, we're talking amongst ourselves. We're not yes. really interested in talking to sort of family students, stories we've seen, sort of, you know, the form of the story and so forth. And that section is still very much there. That's still less truth to it in some cases. Um, open access is obviously becoming increasingly, and obviously I'm very much involved in that. And so journal articles and so forth are going to be made much more available freely online. I don't think the public are generally aware of this yet properly, but they will be soon, hopefully, once it really takes off. Do you think that will help change things and actually get that conversation going? No. No. <laughs> I don't. And, and this is where I, I, I tread on eggshells when I try and catch my answer in diplomatic terms, because <sighs> A lot of the information we put out is pitched at the audience of the academy. And we use conventions and language and styles that aren't necessarily going to be relevant to the people on the street who just want to understand why their ancestors did this or what the history of their area was. And that's not to say that there's a disparity in any ability to comprehend complex information or cogent argument, but that there needs to be some sort of bridging mechanism. This is why if there was an online clearinghouse where the research could still be disseminated through open access models to the research community, but then find a translatory tool to then apply practical benefits to the projects that are feeding information in, then you'd have a much greater degree of engagement and impact. And this, I think, has been the barrier. It may well be that there are some changes, but the means of communication are always similar. And that, I think, still remains something what's so put in by the way. You take a horse of water, you can't make a drink. Then that, I think, is the issue that we face. So I think there's an awful lot more work. I actually gave a version of this at the British Academy when the theme of the two-day symposium was, well, conference, I suppose, was um, society's uses of the past. And I was shot down in flames by suggesting that such a model might be a benefit. Um, I think I was called insidious. Great. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Um, but I think there needs to be a movement on both ways. And I think the public also needs to understand that the vast majority, I always get really frustrated. There was a piece in the papers, I think it was today or yesterday, when they always hold up about research being more meaningful and they always trot out the example about what's the best way to make a piece of toast and all, you know, things such as that, as though that is all academic research is about. So the, the press doesn't help. It, it's, it's very bad at skewing discussion to the extremes. But I think there does need to be a translation mechanism for some of this. And it's getting a lot better. But this is why I think the stakeholders need to be brought together. So if we are trying to look at personal heritage, public history, then the key stakeholders are the constituents who do this. So there's four or five hundred family history societies, there's about to do the same for local history, 
these organisms exist out there, and there have been some great projects that have started, but they also need help, they need support, and they need to understand that they are a key part of it. And uh, just from what I've seen with some of the projects, there's still a sense that they feel as though they are junior partners. So it's better, it's much better than it was. And some of those perceptions have moved, particularly with the rise of public understanding of the humanities and history, showing that there is real impact, and not just a lip service. <coughs> we're, we're, getting the, we're getting towards the right direction, yeah. It's not yeah. But I don't think I can it on its own. Yeah, I imagine it's sort of a beginning, maybe a beginning point on some, for some elements of that, but you're right, there needs to be something that links it. It's the start of a conversation, yeah, but it's a conversation that needs some tailored translation. <laughs>